Total Screen proudly presents their official podcast, On Screen, with your hosts, Tyson Gifford and William Rorig. everybody and welcome to On Screen, the official podcast of the Triple Screen. My name is Tyson. My name is Will. And today we are going to be talking about the kingdom of the planet, of the apes, of the movie, of the theater, of the mall, of the suburb. I'll stop there. We're going to be talking about kingdom of the planet of the apes and we're also going to be talking about some stuff that came out in the news as far as, you know, D23 and some trailers that were released as well as some, you know, other gaming news and some other anime news and other trailer news that are outside of D23. And of course, we have our On the Horizon segment. We're going to be talking about what's coming up ahead. But that's what we're going to be talking about this week. Let's get started with our On the Horizon segment. On the Horizon. On the Horizon. On the Horizon is where we talk about what's coming up in the next week or so. We're going to be starting things off with Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon Cosmos the Movie, which is coming on Thursday, August 22nd to Netflix. Then that 90s show is returning for part two of season two because the streaming services that used to just dump a whole season now drop their seasons in parts instead. And that's coming on Thursday, August 22nd to Netflix. Incoming, which is described as a raunchy high school comedy movie, is coming on Friday, August 23rd to Netflix. The Killer, which is a American remake of the John Woo movie, also done by John Woo. The remake was also made by John Woo, is coming on Friday, August 23rd to Peacock. The Crow, the 2024 version, is going to be hitting theaters, I think in limited release initially, on Friday, August 23rd. And Greedy People, which we talked about, I believe, last week. We talked about the trailer for it. That's the one with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, where he's playing a cop is coming on Friday, August 23rd to theaters, as is Blink Twice, which is the directorial debut of Zoe Kravitz, who was Catwoman in the, the Batman movie recently. But she directed this movie, stars Channing Tatum and a bunch of people. That's coming on Friday, August 23rd as well to theaters. But that is our On the Horizon segment, and now we're moving on to our news segment on the As I mentioned, on the Is Our News segment, our first news story is that Bruce Campbell has stated that there is an Evil Dead animated series in the works, and that if it makes it through production, he will be reprising his role as Ash. He famously retired playing the character, but that was because of the physical performance that he didn't think that he could really do anymore, as he's, he's, he felt he kind of aged out of it. But this would be a voice role, so he's down to reprise. Groovy. <laughs> it's very good good news. Always excited yeah. for anything Bruce Campbell or anything Evil Dead related. So. Oh yeah. yeah, Very very cool. Yeah. Uh, our next news story is that Tango Gameworks the creator of Hi-Fi Rush that was shuttered by Microsoft. Microsoft had set them up and then shuttered them and it was a big story when that happened. A lot of frustration. Well now somehow the company has been bought by Crafton. They're the publisher of PUBG Battlegrounds and not only did they buy the company Tango Gameworks Game works, but they also bought the rights to Hi-Fi Rush. Yes, and they want to expand the Hi-Fi Rush IP, which includes a sequel, other spin-offs. We know like a sequel was already planned by Tango when the shutdown occurred. Mm-hmm. And this is interesting because this is something that like never happens. What's interesting is this was a talent grab for Crafton. Uh it says like uh that they bought Tango Gameworks because they wanted the team, and that's why they, they extended offers to like everybody to come back mm-hmm. and it's such 
whiplash for me to like see Microsoft does not care about the talent. Crafton does. And it's such a difference in philosophy. It's, it's, it's staggering. So Tango Gameworks, that was Shinji Mikami, right? That was Shinji Mikami's, uh, yes. That was his independent studio. Is he that, coming along with this too? I don't think so. I, he, he left, uh, Tango before Microsoft shut it down. Presumably not related to like any, not related to shutdown, but like for his own personal reasons. He didn't, so he I, didn't directly work on Hi-Fi Rush either, did he? Did he, he just kind of like help set up? Oh, the no, yeah. or something? Yeah, he, he was the producer on that. But like, he wasn't like a, a director on it or anything. He no, wasn't like directly involved. The last involved. game he directed, I believe, was The Evil Within. Okay. So yeah, so he was just kind of like setting up the studio pretty much. Yeah. And Shinji Mikami, like, uh, his idea behind the studio was studio, like, he set up to train and develop the next generation of game developers. His attempt to make his own Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. Like a company that kind of like sticks around and and builds up talent, you know? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think Tango Gameworks would have been, like, an amazing Nintendo purchase, but I don't think they were on Nintendo's radar because of the way Microsoft shut them down. Right, but yeah, But exactly. I'm glad somebody got them, especially the fact that this is happening after the shutdown, like, months after. So, a lot of the talent probably had already started to move on to other things and got called back for this, I'm sure, so... Oh, oh yeah, definitely. And it, it, it's good, you, you know, don't see happy stories like this in gaming no. like that often so this is kind of new yeah Mikami says uh, the last thing he said when he left is you know he wants to create an environment for young developers to get experience and he also wants to distance himself from survival horror games mm -hmm. Hi-Fi Rush looks very different from survival horror <laughs> yeah that's it for our regular news stories but we got some trailers to go over we're going to start things off with Bakaru which is a game that came out last year in Japan and wasn't being local now, the, what's interesting about this, besides the fact that it's finally getting localized and brought over here, is that this game comes from Goodfeel. That's the developer probably best known for stuff like Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World and the recent Peach Showtime game, you know? So it, it's, uh, they're like a developer that works very closely with Nintendo. And this is a game on the Switch, but it's not published by Nintendo. But even more interesting is that this game is a spiritual successor to the Gomon franchise. Yes. Which Konami is basically just let die on the vine. Like, uh, pretty much yeah. everything Konami has, right? I mean, right. Konami's uh, let I mean, a lot of great gaming IPs die on the vine. Oh, oh yeah. We're, we're still waiting on a new Castlevania, like, new Gradius, uh, you know, like, a it's, new Sui Koden. Yeah, it's funny, before we started recording, you said that this game qualifies in that category of the fine, I'll do it myself. Yes. Meaning, like, Konami wasn't going to make a new Gomon game, so people that previously worked on the Gomon games said, hey, we'll do the Gomon game and we'll just give it a different name. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what this is, which puts it in kind of similar category as well. You mentioned Castlevania. The same thing happened with Castlevania. Oh um, yeah, with uh, Bloodstained. Yeah. With yeah. Uh, Iga. I was trying to yeah, search in my yeah. mind for Iga's name, you know? <laughs> because Iga, like, after they made like the last DS Castlevania game, Order of Ecclesia, Iga wanted to continue making Metroidvania games, but Konami... Konami's Konami like, no, to. you're going to do smartphone games now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he's like, I'm doing Castlevania on smartphone. And they said, no. No. <laughs> you're going to make garbage that nobody is going to remember in, uh, in, uh, even one year from now. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why, you know, we, we never got uh, another Retroidvania Castlevania game for like 3DS or anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is similar in line to that. Like, this looks very much like the it's, 3D going it's on It's not games. Kickstarter. We're, we're like the... Uh, oh, Oh, no. Let's this say is... was Kickstarter. This is not Kickstarter. This isn't our developer. No, this funded is being it. published by Spike Chuns Chunsaw. Yeah. But uh... it just looks remarkably like I'd never heard of this game. And I saw the trailer for it. And immediately I thought of Mystical Ninja starring Goemon, which is the N64, the first N64 entry in the franchise. I was like, this looks so much like Mystical Ninja starring Goemon, which I loved at the time. It's one of the only N64. I always dis the N64. I think there's like five games worth playing on it. This is one of the five I would count. And that's for me because I don't like first-person shooters, so you know, Goldeneye and Perfect Dark and all that doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> so my list oh, of N64 okay. games that I love is very small. Very, oh. very small. But oh, uh, oh yeah. like Mystical Ninja starring Gomon is definitely one of them. So I was hyped when I saw 
this trailer just because I'm like, yeah, this looks like Mystical Ninja. This looks entirely like Mystical Ninja. And then, you know, talking to you about it when we're putting the show notes together and everything, it's like, oh, wait, this actually is a spiritual successor to yeah, Mystical like Ninja. The CEO of Goodfield was like the series lead on uh, the Goemon series. Mm-hmm. He, he worked at Konami on the Goemon games, so. Yeah, which makes me even more excited for this because this means like, okay, this, yeah, this should be good. The Goemon games were ridiculous. They had like random weird musical numbers and just all sorts of funny stuff that happened. They were just, and they were very distinctly Japanese and not in that like very anime way. Like you get like a lot of JRPGs and stuff. I mean like very specifically steeped in like Japanese culture yeah. in general. And that's why like, ni- that's why 90% of those games never came, never left Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And this one looks like they're, they said it's going to cover the 42 provinces of Japan. Like you're yes. going to visit all of them through it or something. And it's like, oh, that's cool. Like I'm, I'm really down for this. Yeah. Yeah, it looks awesome. It does. Yeah. There's also a demo out for the game on the Switch right now, so you can check that out. Our okay. next trailer was for Hysteria, which is coming to Peacock. We talked about this a long time ago when the like news about them making this first came out. I don't mm. even think they had any of the cast yet. You know, like they d- didn't say anything about that. It was just like the basic concept, which was like, okay, so this is about the satanic panic. And I remember the news had come out. I think it was around the time Stranger Things 4, like Season 4 was out. And Stranger Things Season 4 like really hit on the Satanic Panic too. So it was kind of like, okay, people are going to be covering Satanic Panic type stuff, you know? And that's what Hysteria is. It's like, it's about the Satanic Panic and it follows a, a heavy metal band that's using the Satanic Panic as like a way to like market themselves, like to make themselves look scary and intriguing. But then there's like other stuff going on too with like, you know, parent groups and stuff that are going into hysterics because because they think that, you know, Satan worshipping groups are taking over the world and stuff. And so it's kind of all about that. It looks really interesting. I got, from the trailer, I, I got kind of even like lost vibes from it. I don't know, like like there's some kind of a mystery going on or something. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, Julie Bowen's in it. She was in Modern Family. She was also in Lost, by the way. She was, she's the woman who's in the trailer. She was uh, Jack's wife in Lost. Oh, okay. Like that you only saw in the flashbacks. But yeah, so it's like lots of different kind of interesting interesting areas and this is also it's just it's peacock and peacock's doing a few kind of interesting things they've done a few interesting shows that kind of surprise me the kind of things i just wouldn't think anybody would make you know like miss davis which was that one from damon lindelof that was just really off the wall and weird you know and i I, i'm really surprised that show existed at all but peacock like signed that one so i mean peacock still not doing too well as a streaming service but if they're making like weird swings like this then i'm all for it you know, hopefully they can make some return on on these investments because I like the weird stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, weird stuff is good. Next up, we got a trailer for Craven the Hunter. This is, of course, connected to the Sony Spider Verse canon with Venom and all that kind of stuff. Morbius, you know, the the, the true classics, Madam Web, all all those classics, <laughs> all those classics of cinema. Yeah, uh, we're going to get the Criterion Collection yeah, pretty uh, soon. The Criterion Sony Spider Verse collection yeah yeah we got a trailer for it before wasn't too great i mean it had some cool looking action as far as like really violent stuff yeah kind of made me think of like the marvel netflix shows you know right it yeah looks, it looks like, maybe like slightly lower budget than the marvel netflix shows uh it, it just looks so formulaic so boring yeah it looks like they spent more money on it but like it just oh yeah. my god the formula is there there's like nothing new about yeah, and they're this. just they're wildly changing the and and the whole thing the is comics, like yeah yeah and the whole thing is like oh it, it's about a spider-man villain as the protagonist but in this case you know oh they, they they want you to sympathize with them and they don't want him to be evil he's the protagonist hero but he's also the villain so he's got to be bad he's got to be he's just age. a guy on a quest for vengeance instead of a hunter yeah he's I mean, a it's literally in the title vengeance. that he's a hunter but the thing is like oh he's got to be edgy right so like so like he will kill people and like there will be like gore and shit and it's like all oh, but yeah yeah but like yeah he, it's just oh man nothing at all interesting about this yeah 
I mean, like, uh, the interesting is how how well, ripped how, how ripped the actor got. Uh, Aaron yeah, K- K- Aaron Taylor uh, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, he got he got really ripped for Craven the Hunter. He he got done dirty in Age of Ultron, man. Yeah, to Joss try to Sweden find his dirty. comic book connection elsewhere, you know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It just looks so. Ju- I just thought, oh, this is like a John Wick ripoff at this point. Yeah, it, it and it doesn't look great. And then the big thing is like they they showed like the big sticker was like they showed the rhino. It's like oh okay. But now it's like the rhino is like a guy who turns like into a rhino versus like wasn't it supposed yeah. to be like a costume or something? Yeah, it was like a dude in like a suit. Like I mean, he has like super strength and super invulnerability and stuff. And they're yeah, doing like, that with Craven too. They're they're giving him like powers and stuff. Where in the comics wasn't he just like a guy that was good at hunting? He does have access to powers in the comics. Yeah, but it looks different like, than the ones we're seeing in the. Yeah, they're really like. I think uh, he has like interpreting. In, I think like there's like the serum he ingests that like gives him like superhuman abilities. But yeah, I mean, there's. It's just funny how Sony never that. got the comic accurate pitch. You know what I mean? Like, right, yeah, Marvel, like you know, with when MCU started really going strong, they really started pushing for more like comic accuracy see in the movies That's what made and there was a it, huge I, fan yeah. support for that and it got really popular and like if you look at the stuff that people hated in the mcu most of it's the stuff that started diverging from comic yeah. accuracy yeah i would say like the <laughs> mcu's like initial successes because they were starting to do stuff more comic accurate because you know anybody who's who is a comic fan and lived through like the 90s especially knows how frustrating an era that was for comic book film adaptations where they they would just like do wildly like different stuff it was just like why yeah it's just uh ah uh, man it's like sony didn't get that memo yeah it's like sony's like sony's still like making movies like it's the 90s it's like oh okay yeah it's like with no awareness of what's happening around them and, and it's trying to kind of still do their own universe like they could have collaborated more with marvel and, and probably made something actually interesting but you know they didn't want to do that they wanted their own universe so they could take all the money from it but look what they've been doing with it. Yeah. You know, the Venom movies were successful, but sucked. Uh, Madam Web was a huge fucking flop. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And it sucked, apparently. I haven't seen it, so I can't say. Uh, same goes for, you know, the whole Morbius debacle. And now it's like, this looks like it's just going to be the next in line. You know, there's a third Venom movie coming. That will probably be successful as well, but it'll probably suck as well as the other two Venom movies did. So, eh. The Venom movies work because Venom is like one of Marvel's most popular characters, you know, behind Spider Man and Wolverine. Yeah, that's you know, definitely Hardy. like and Tom Hardy. Yeah, Tom Hardy is great. He's uh, doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yes. But yeah, so that's Craven the Hunter. Next we're gonna start moving on to our D twenty three trailers. We got a few in here that were majorly released, but then we have two also that were not publicly released. That were only available to attendees of the show and those who sail the seven seas. We we weren't supposed to see these trailers. <laughs> but we did, did, and we'll be this... talking about them. <laughs> yes. We're going to start things off with Skeleton Crew. This is the new TV series for Star Wars that's got like a decidedly Amblin feel to it. It it definitely is. It's, it's Steven Spielberg. It looks like Goonies by way of Star Wars. Yeah, this is, is, like this is from the, the guy that did uh, the, the recent Spider-Man movies for Marvel, though. Yeah. It's the guy that, that's behind it's, this. It's got Jude Law in it as a Jedi. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you see him for about it's, two it's, seconds. Yeah, see him for about two seconds at the end. Yeah, it's about a group of kids going on an adventure in the galaxy, like a like Goonies style adventure. I'm trying to think of the name of the movie that this really reminds me of. There was an 80s movie that really reminded me. I think it was called Explorers, and it was about these kids and they built like a spaceship. Yeah, huh. and it stars uh, Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix. They're saying they they were off explorers it just very much has that vibe like we can (laughs) you could say this has like a goonies vibe but like you know you look at something like stranger things very much has like you know a certain vibe of like a combination of like those different kind of things whereas like this feels very very close to explorers like you can see there's some et and some other stuff in there too and some goonies in there as well but like overall like explorers was about these kids that made a spaceship from like stuff they found in a junk Yard. And then they took the spaceship and ended up landing on a, a spa- like an alien spacecraft that was like in our orbit or something. And then we're like on an adventure in you know outer space or something. And that's what this exact 
exactly feels like. It's a bunch of kids. They find this rune, this like old Jedi temple. They go, they explore it. They end up like on a spaceship. The the hyperdrive activates. And now all of a sudden they're out in the galaxy somewhere away from home. And they're like little kids, including some, you know, non-human ass kids. So, uh, right. Yeah. I, I had mixed feelings with this. I really like the idea of it because I kind of burnt on Star Wars and I'm like, I like the idea that when they pitched this, when they were talking about it, that it was going to be like inspired by like Amblin Entertainment type movies, you know, the Spielberg type stuff. And it was going to kind of be like an adventure with like a cast that was mostly like children. And, and I was like, I really like the idea of that. I'm like, okay, they're doing something really different with it. And there's parts in the trailer that I'm like, okay, I really get that. I really get that vibe. But then there's other things that they did in this that are some of the things I hate most about Star Wars. And if people talk about what's the worst Star Wars movie, the one that I've seen that I'll always bring up is Attack of the Clones. And the jump the shark kind of like really shitty moment that made me really notice like how bad that movie was is the scene where Obi-Wan's like in like a 50s diner. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And that that was like the first moment where I'm like, what the fuck is this? And it really like (laughs) took me out of the whole experience. And I'm like, this is garbage, you know? And this trailer had like that in it in the sense of like, okay, we're seeing a suburb in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah, that that fits with the whole Amblin thing. But like, oh, I don't know, man. Yeah, like like it doesn't fit in like Star Wars. We've never seen like a suburb in Star Wars. Yeah, something about it just doesn't feel right, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Like, I'm still down to check this out just because I do like the base concept and there was other stuff I saw in it that I really liked. I like the guy who's handling this. He did this recent Spider-Man movies, like we said. He was supposed to do Fantastic Four, but ended up backing out on that. Yeah, there's enough in here that makes me still want to watch it. But for the first time, the trailer gave me, like, trepidation about it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty indifferent. I don't care. It might did the summer fun. stuff bother you at all? No, actually, it kind of didn't face it. I don't know why. It's kind really of weird in, like, me. retrospect. Like, thinking the about 50s it, like, diner yeah. bothered me and the suburbs in this bothered me. I'm not necessarily against the idea of, like, what would a suburb in a galaxy far, far away look like. It's just that it looks too much like our suburbs, and it right, makes yeah. it look unnatural. Nothing, yeah, nothing, you know, it looks unnatural, because if it looks like something from, like, modern-day Earth, like, nothing in Star Wars is designed to, like, look like that, so, like, having that, like, suddenly be there is, like, weird, right? It's jarring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's about what I have to say about it. The next trailer kind of had similar thoughts to what I did with Skeleton Crew for, which is something I've been really looking forward to, which is Agatha all along. And the last trailer I thought was all right. It was just kind of a tease, though. It wasn't didn't really give me enough. And then this trailer was kind of like, ah, uh, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I was I was just like watching and saying like, who's this for? Like, it looks where? very like Disney what? afternoon movie. Yeah, like, I, Disney Channel afternoon movie from the nineties, you know? Yeah, exactly. It looks very much like that. I'm confused what tone this is supposed to be going for. Like, is this horror? Is this comedy? I knew they were going for kind of like spooky Halloween vibes, and but like yeah. not horror, but like just kind of like, you know, like PG, hor- like spooky yeah. kind of vibes. And I was okay with that. If it was something like, say, The Witches, like it had kind of that kind of vibe. It's like, okay, that works, you know, that would work here. But this is looking like more like Hocus Pocus, or even like yeah. lighter than Hocus Pocus. Right, yeah, exactly. And it's, um, I'm, I'm just like, <sighs> The vibe is just looking too light. Like it's, for, for something as serious as Agatha the Harkness and what she tried to do in WandaVision and what was going on with all of that and all the stuff that's going on like it just doesn't seem serious enough and I'm all, all for like a lighthearted turn and like weird humor and, and that kind of stuff I love those parts in WandaVision I loved Agatha in WandaVision you know but this right, just looks, yeah. it's I don't know man the tone's just not hitting me on this yeah exactly it's it, it, totally it's like weird yeah it's like you have Aubrey Plaza like coming out of the ground like a zombie or something and she gets up and she's just like oh sup <laughs> am I late to the party and I'm like okay like I guess that's a cute joke but also like it's total whiplash see that didn't bother me so much as like the musical parts did yeah and it's like and again I'm not even necessarily opposed to it having musical parts 
I mean, Agatha Alon gets its title from a musical part from WandaVision, you know? Like, right, I'm which not they are very much, like, in love with, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm, uh. not even, I'm not even opposed to that. Like, but just, like, the kind of musical thing it did just seemed kind of goofy and weird. Like, they're talking about, like, taking on this trial and going down the witch's trail, and then it's looking like, I don't know, like, this is giving me Ewok Christmas special, y- y- you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what, like, really struck me about this is, like, the fact that, like, the entire trailer, like, goes on and on about the witch's trail, like, how dangerous it is and stuff, but they, like, never at any point in the trailer, like, really demonstrate that. Yeah. I mean, I'm still gonna watch this. It's the same team behind WandaVision, and I don't mean Marvel, I mean, like, the same showrunner and stuff like that. Yeah, so, yeah. So I'm down for it for that, because I loved WandaVision. I think it's one of the best things in the entirety of Phase 4, movies included, and in my opinion, I know it's not yours, but in my opinion, it's the best uh, TV show that Marvel's done. Mm, and yeah, like so, that I would alone, say Loki is better. Yeah, I, I mean, that's where we disagree on it. But it's like to me, that alone means that this is a watch for me. I'm going to watch it. I mean, that's probably it, it went might from be me something... being like really excited about it to being like kind of you know again trepidatious. You it know? might be something that like plays better like in context actually, when you're actually like, watching it. Yeah, yeah, then like then like in like trailers like cut up into bits to form a trailer. Yeah. I mean, that could be. I mean, that's the way things happen. One of my favorite movies of all time is Fight Club. I remember the first trailer for Fight Club and being like, what the fuck is this? Right, And it yeah. wasn't until I saw, like, David Fincher's name that I said, okay, I should check this out. But everything else, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, <laughs> this doesn't even make any sense. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, this looks weird. Like, nothing, like, but not in a good way. Like, nothing was really, like, hitting for me. And then you actually watch the movie and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, they, this is like a hard, this would have been a really hard movie to properly advertise without giving away everything that it's about. Right, yeah, exactly. So maybe that's the case with Agatha all along. Hopefully that's the case with Agatha all along because for the first time, I'm feeling trepidation on that one as well. So, so far the D23 trailers have not been hitting it for me, but now we're going to move on to the ones that we weren't supposed to see. Yeah. I have an order that, we were, we were what do you want to start with? Do you want to start with oh, Thunderbolts so, or Daredevil? Let's start with Thunderbolts. Let's start with the weaker of the two. <laughs> In my opinion, I thought they. Were, I thought both of these were great. Oh the yeah, no. By the way, yeah, I was. I was really like, yes, Thunderbolts looks solid. Yeah. I will say that, and I was skeptical because it's the same writers. I think it's the same director, even of like uh, Black Widow. And anybody who's been following this podcast knows that that's my least favorite Marvel movie of all of them. And so I was skeptical. But I, you mean the, MCU this, movie of all of them, right? Yeah, MCU. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You're not counting Madam Web. And more BS. Yo, yeah, oh, I'm not counting. <laughs> yeah, no, Sony stuff doesn't count in that statement. I haven't even like. You're not counting the movies. old Fantastic Four movies, or <laughs> the unreleased Roger Corman movie. Yeah, or or yeah. the uh, or the two with uh, Alba and Evans, or the one. Oh with, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, those the movies, one with like Michael I B. Never, Jordan, I, that, that I the never, director oh, doesn't yeah, claim. I, that movie's horrible. Yeah, no, yeah. This is the worst worst MCU. But no, I I, I saw this like, and I think Thunderbolts conceptually was like a great concept. Concept. This isn't like really following that concept as far as I know, because like the the initial conception was the Masters of Evil, like masquerading as a new superhero team. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is obviously going to be. This is more like of a Suicide Squad vibe. Yeah, very much so. This, like, yeah. I think I said like uh, the movie should be called like uh, the Kill Yourself Team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This is Marvel's Suicide Squad. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's cool. Like the the trailer like really focuses on Yelena, which like makes sense because if you're going to like because this is also like a like a sort of sequel to Black Widow. So like mm-hmm. if you're going to like narratively flow from Black Widow to this, you're going to focus on Yelena as like the main character, right? I like what they showed too because you talk about Black Widow being your least favorite. I would argue that Black Widow is like half of a really good movie. I mean, there's good stuff like, in there. Like, yeah, that's the thing. Yelena, it's not like, like everything like, in it's yeah. bad. Like half no. of it's really good. Like all the family stuff is great. Yes. In Black Widow. But it's just almost all the other stuff. And, and, I, and I, I loved Yelena yeah, in Black and, Widow. And that's how this trailer opens is with Yelena visiting 
her dad in quotation marks that red guardian and that kind of like i love that they opened on just like a full scene basically yeah like it wasn't like you know they showed off a few like teaser kind of clips or something like that like they just straight up opening with her visiting him and him going like oh i'm not here or something and then she's like it's elena and he's like oh and you can hear him like frantically like rearranging trying to clean up the place and then she gets there and it's still like filthy inside and stuff and it's like that kind of like weird dysfunctional family kind of like but there, there's love between them kind of thing that was in Black Widow that's what was good in Black Widow yeah and so oh, seeing it yeah. here it's like okay yeah so they got the, at least the best parts of Black Widow are in here you know if they're gonna take something from Black Widow at least they did take the best parts and then they show you know Elena ends up in this room and like the other Thunderbolts like show up and they they're all like fighting each other mm-hmm. and then a so, guy yeah. named Bob shows up yes Bob he's Bob. in the room he's like he's all who are you he's like, I'm Bob like all these like Thunderbolts are there and then Bob yeah he's Bob well apparently we know who he is I already know who he is yeah, yeah I, I do too but I don't know should we just not say it oh uh, is it yeah. supposed to be a secret still <laughs> you know yeah I guess it's supposed to be a surprise so we we'll say it. yeah we won't we won't say this isn't full spoilers yeah a character named Bob shows up that's just like some guy named Bob and yes. uh yeah and then you realize that it looks like Valentina set up the Thunderbolts to kill each other like they were no longer useful to her or something uh, that's what yeah. it looks like from the trailer and then it's going into kind of like a suicide squad type thing so yeah i mean i think it looks great we'll have to see what everything is oh, yeah, it looks think, solid. i don't think we mentioned this but they announced at comic-con that the asterisk it's kind of stupid but the asterisk is supposed to be like six bullets from the six members of the team oh is that what it is oh, it's like okay. the six bullet holes from the team oh, okay <laughs> making an asterisk like that's what they they, they made a big deal about having the asterisk there then that that's what it ended up being okay but that's Thunderbolts that trailer I thought it was good now we're gonna move on to Daredevil Born Again got our first trailer for that there was a lot of concern when Daredevil Born Again was first announced people were super psyched then we started hearing reports and people were not that happy then we got She-Hulk and people were really upset at that point (laughs) I'll put on record you did not like She-Hulk I did like She-Hulk but I didn't want Daredevil to be the tone of She-Hulk, you know? Oh, no. (laughs) But people were concerned about that. Right, and it's been confirmed like the show that we're getting now is like it's a different show than what was originally being developed at some point marvel had a change of plans and they they retooled this to be a continuation of the netflix series because originally it wasn't going to be yeah it was going to be like its own thing or its own interpretation of daredevil separate from like what netflix now like apparently like marvel's like gone ahead and just like embraced the netflix stuff Mm -hmm. and i say it's all for it and uh I mean, I at was least watching it's Daredevil. <laughs> at least with Daredevil, and I, and I was watching this. It looks fantastic. Big thing. Nice to see John Bernthal back as the Punisher. That was that was excellent. Mm-hmm. Nice to see that in the trailer. Nice to see like you know Karen Vincent and, D'Onofrio as yeah, Kingpin, Vincent D'Onofrio, and not in obviously. a weird goofy version of Kingpin. Right. Yeah. Nice to see uh, Foggy and Karen, and looks like it's got the same tone. Oh, we saw Bullseye in there for a second. Yeah, he was in uh, uh, prison clothes. Yep, we got to see like a, a new villain for a suit. Looks like White Tiger. I don't even know who that is. So. But it's looking good. It just it looks like Netflix Daredevil, but it looks like a little bit of a higher budget. Yeah, like, Netflix Daredevil was good, but it always kind of felt like it was on a shoestring. Like it was a bunch of people that were really passionate about making it, but they didn't really have much budget. Even when they did like later seasons, even when they would have like some really cool stunts scenes and stuff like that it felt like everything was really locked down like okay you know the sets were like very closed in and very small and stuff like it just felt like that you know and this feels like a lot like broader and more opened up and i think that that is a a boon to this series like they're getting mcu money now right doing the same kind of thing i think what had me a little bit concerned about this and i still am a little bit concerned as well is that hawkeye was kind of a tonal mess when it was kind of fun 
funny and weird, it worked. And then when they uh-huh. tried to be more serious, it really didn't. Right. And yeah. It kind of became a mess. And then they followed that up with Echo. And yeah, Echo was... just was not good. Yeah, that just yeah, Echo was really disappointing. Yeah. To me. So I was I a little bit concerned and still am a little bit concerned that, that that's gonna be kind of like, is this how Disney and the MCU is going to handle Netflix Marvel? You know, like they're gonna do it this way or something. But this trailer is making it look a little bit better. But then again, we have been fooled by MCU TV show trailers before. Right. Secret Invasion, for example. The trailer looks like it retains the same tone from the Netflix series. Mm -hmm. So, like, I don't know, it looked good to me. Yeah, it definitely looks good to me. I'm still concerned, not because of anything from the trailer, but because of, you know, what's happened with Hawkeye and Echo. Um, Mm -hmm. But definitely it did look really good and had that tone and it's good to see Punisher back. It's good to see, you know, Kingpin being Kingpin again. Even seeing Foggy and Karen again is exciting. But that is Daredevil Born Again. And that's the end of our trailers and the end of our news segment. And that leaves only our final segment. Full spoilers. This week on Full Spoilers, we're going to be talking about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which was directed by Wes Ball, who is going to be directing the new Legend of Zelda movie at Sony, which still makes me feel weird saying those words. (laughs) Sony Pictures Zelda movie. Yeah. This was also, Uh... oddly enough, this was written by Josh Friedman, who was the showrunner of the Sarah Chronic Chronicles. Oh, nice, nice. I'll say first off, like, I already saw the movie, like I saw it a while ago, and I we talked about it briefly after I saw it, like in our on tap segment. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it yet. it's like I was going to ask you a question. I'm, I was getting like a bit of deja vu with that, and I was like, I couldn't figure out why. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. So I already talked about it really briefly, but I was being very vague because you hadn't seen it, and I didn't want to spoil anything for you. And I was mostly phrasing the conversation around the director going to be doing Legend of Zelda. But now you've seen it, and you've seen the other Planet of the Apes movies, right? Because I've mentioned before but I've seen the old Planet of the Apes movies and I've seen the Tim Burton one and then I've seen this one. I haven't uh, by seen the way, any Josh, of the other ones. Josh Friedman uh, also wrote the script for Fantastic Four First Steps. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I like Josh Friedman, so that's good. Yeah. I hadn't seen the ones that preceded this movie, the, the so, other trilogy that preceded this. So you, so this was like the first one of like the reboots that you've seen. Yeah, I mean, unless you count the Tim Burton one, you know, <laughs> which I no, don't. But... No, we don't for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the the <laughs> first of that canon of those movies, yeah, uh, uh, that I've seen of the four of those four. But you've seen all of those, right? I've seen the first two. I still haven't seen the third one, like War for the Planet of the Apes, which I was going to watch it before this, but then I was just like, I was busy, and so I was like, you know what? This isn't like a direct sequel to that anyway. Like this is like its own jumping on point. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, I don't think it's super necessary, and no, it wasn't. So I yeah, was like, oh, I was. A- I was a little worried when I went to the movie. I'm like, this feels like its own jumping off point. I heard that it takes place a long time after that, so there shouldn't be any characters I need to be worried about that I, I don't know. And so when I went to the movie, I was like, yeah, okay, this is fine. Like, I, I they kind of sum it, up it everything probably, I needed to know in the beginning, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they show, like, Caesar's funeral at the beginning to kind of, like, hammer home how important of a figure he is. And, you know, like, and, and we do have, like, characters in here talk about Caesar and his importance. I, I mean, it's probably more meaningful to the viewer if you like actually know who Caesar is mm-hmm. but like if you go back to the original Planet of the Apes film in the 60s you know Caesar is like a lore character but like that that movie takes place like ages after Caesar is dead like Caesar is it, in the Tim Burton one too it's the first movie in the, like, the franchise and like Caesar is dead so it's it's not like super important that you like jump in knowing like all about Caesar mm-hmm. we don't and follow all, all you have to know is like he's, all you have to know is like he's an important figure to like the society yeah you know yeah we don't like follow his ghost around or anything no. And if we did, we'd, 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 it's, somebody it's, would have to say, greet Caesar's ghost. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. But, like, I've enjoyed all these movies from the reboot uh, so far. Like, the first two were, were solid. By the way, like, Matt Reeves did the, directed the first three movies of this franchise, of the reboots. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, like... The Batman. Um, yeah, the Batman. So the first two were, like, I thought were solid movies. First one was good. Second one was fantastic. They're basically, like, prequels, like, building up to, like, the creation of this world. The first one is literally James Franco creating Caesar in the first place. Mm-hmm. And way it goes from there. Yeah, and it, it unleashes basically, like, a plague. It develops these apes and makes them more sentient, and then it diminishes humans at the same time. Yeah, which I thought was, like, an interesting, interesting way to, like, go about it and explain, like, how the world can be ruled by apes. Mm -hmm. And then this one takes place, like, a hundred years or so after. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What did you think of, like, first off, just kind of the world as we see it in this? Like, you kind of saw the world crumbling in those first two movies, our modern world crumbling, and now you're seeing it overtaken by nature. Yeah. It looks, it looks, yeah, it looks stunning. It looks beautiful by the way. Yeah. There's all sorts of really cool stuff in here. I just watched something on Quarter Crew where they were they were going over the effect shots in this and they were gushing about uh some of the effect shots in this movie and saying some of them are some of the best effect shots like in existence like right now. Like right like uh there's one with a character one of the apes is in water and they said it's one of the best effect shots they've ever seen and stuff. And they were gushing over like the kind of design of the world and everything. So it's kind of cool seeing that before we started up our conversation to kind of like get me a little bit more hype to talk about it oh yeah so what did you think as relates to the other movies like how did this work as a follow-up to those movies as far as like it's cool to see like the evolution of the world Mm -hmm. and the universe like this to see how it gets built up and like now it's more fully formed it's actual apes rule the world and you have like ape societies it's really cool to like get to the point to like seeing that in full in this reboot franchise. So, like, I, I really enjoyed seeing that. And uh, I thought it was a solid movie. I thought it was solid, really good, like, adventure movie. I thought, like, Noah was, like, a good protagonist. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned when we talked about it through the lens of, like, a Zelda movie is, like, he's not too far from Link in the sense that he's almost a silent protagonist. Yeah. He, he's a man of very few words or an ape of very few words, you know? And it makes me go, like, okay, well, this is probably how you could do Zelda with Link is you just have a character, you give him dialogue because it's a movie, but just not a lot. You make him somebody that just doesn't talk a lot and stuff. You make him somebody that's more, you know, internal and, and contemplative and, and that works, you know, and it worked here with Noah. So there's a lot in this movie that made me think about like how they're going to do Zelda and thinking like it's probably in good hands after seeing this movie. Oh yeah. It's got like these platforming set pieces, right? Yeah. Or like Noah's so we can, there's like, there's a big set piece at the beginning where he's doing this platforming to get to like a hawk's an egg, eagle egg, eagle egg. Yeah. yeah, and he's doing like all this crazy stuff. Like he's using like this bar as a handhold and everything. And it, it's pretty crazy. And you know, it gives you an idea of the kind of set pieces that you could find in like a Zelda movie, right? Yeah, I thought even like the main village kind of reminded me of like the bird village in Breath of the Wild. Yeah, like which is with the high platforms because of the eagle nest and stuff up there. And I was like, yeah, this kind of feels like that. Like I, I could just kind of get that same feeling. And, and all the kind of climbing and stuff made me think of Breath of the Wild, of course, you know? And yeah, there's just so much that like makes me feel like this is a good prelude to The Legend of Zelda, you know? in that sense. But what did you think about this compared to the other Planet Apes movies? Since I haven't seen them, is this like living up to the other movies? It, it, it's yeah. kind of starting its own trilogy or something in yeah, the same like canon, the but kind of separate at the same time. Right, yeah. Does it feel like like you like the first two? Does this feel like it kind of belongs with those? Like it, like it yeah. fits in? Yeah, yeah, it fits in. It fits in perfectly fine. I thought it was a solid movie. I liked uh, the villain, Proximus. Like you know who, the villain you know who was did the villain? Who? That's uh, Kevin Durand, who, oh. uh, not Durant, the basketball player, but Durand, yeah. uh, who was uh, Kimi and Lost. Oh, oh, Kimi. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. More more Lost uh, connections. I was surprised when I saw him. I'm like, really? That's him? 
him? That's him going, what a wonderful night or whatever. <laughs> right, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, I didn't I didn't know he had that in him. That's cool. I also saw him recently and he's in Abigail, that vampire ballerina movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he appears in like one of the trailers for that. Yeah. So it's kind of cool uh, seeing him again. So, yeah, I love anybody who's in Lost. So oh, that's yeah. the first like, one that comes to mind. I enjoyed it. It's a solid film. I hope they keep making them. Mm-hmm. I hope it comes full circle to like a full remake of Planet of the Apes. With the do you think they should the do that? Do you think they should just stop and then make it so that it loops to the original movies? Or... <laughs> yeah, right. No, they should do that. They do the full remake. They already set up because they already established in Rise of the Planet of the Apes through like a scene where like James Franco is watching the news that the astronaut from the original movie he is shot into space right before like everything starts to collapse. Yeah, it's interesting like how that kind of threads that needle, but you want them to actually continue it, so you want them to do this trilogy and then go and redo the original movies as like another yeah. trilogy kind of. Or at least like the first one. The rest of the movies are like, they get kind of weird with it. Like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> when you get to like Beneath the Planet of the Apes and stuff, it gets a little weird. Yeah, Beneath the Planet of the Apes where like Charlton Heston like ends the world, uh, <laughs> just, just blows up the planet, and then the rest of the movie these are like literally the three chimps like they survive they go back in time to like the 1970s or it was like then like modern times and then oh it's like goofy like oh they're they're chimps with like now they're in like modern day america you don't want them to remake that one yeah i'd imagine they would probably if they did remake them they would they would remake it like the first one and then probably do a trilogy but like would kind of follow the first one structurally and then yes. change it after that you know yeah yeah exactly that's what i would think because they started getting a little weird after that yeah <laughs> i have only kind of vague memories of the old Planet of the Eight movies like I, I'd watch them on TV when I was like a little kid they used to marathon those like all the time you know oh, yeah. remember that was like a thing like I think it was like every Memorial Day or something every AMC channel would just would, be like, marathoning old shit yes like every channel was marathoning old shit you know that's like all that was on like you'd have like a Scooby-Doo marathon on one channel and then another channel uh, about Planet of the Apes and yeah oh yeah 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 AMC would do Planet of the Apes marathons and yeah. then of course you got the Christmas Story marathon on Christmas every year that's uh fx isn't it or no i think that was uh also that was tv or tbs or TNT. yeah yeah it's tbs i think yeah when they just, do the christmas like... story for 24 hours straight yes uh that's what planet of the apes was for me when i was younger that's how i saw those movies I, my memories of it are very vague like i remember some of the very iconic scenes of course the ending of planet of the apes is like super iconic you know and like that like sticks out in my mind and i remember like when they like initially captured him and you saw the other humans and stuff and they were kind of like livestock and stuff like I remember all of that you know but like I don't yeah. I don't have like very coherent memories of the rest of that those movies because it was I was uh, so young yeah I, I don't have coherent memories of like most of those movies yeah <laughs> like yeah like I haven't watched any of them in ages I don't really think I have much desire to go back and rewatch them either so uh but has this made you interested in watching any of the reboot movies Yes, definitely. I've, I've definitely thought about it, except that some of the stuff that kind of made me a little hesitant on Planet of the Apes in the original movies is not here in this movie, which makes me feel like I'm just going to like this trilogy more, this new one, if they continue right. it, you know? But I do kind of want to check it out now. I'm just kind of a little bit burnt on. Although this is also like kind of post-apocalyptic, it's kind of yeah. like post-post-apocalyptic, and I think I'm kind of just a little burnt out on, on post one post-apocalyptic, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of burnt, like, with The Last of Us and Sweet Tooth and The Walking Dead and, you know, there's so many, like, post-apocalyptic things that I've seen yeah, recently. The, yeah, the, the first trilogy of the reboot is really, very much, like, it's Caesar's story and it's about, like, the creation of this world and how this world comes to be, right? Mm -hmm. and Whereas that, this is, like, post-post-apocalyptic. And yeah. so it's a little bit different, like, vibe-wise. So I think I'm more into this, like, tonally than I would be into the original ones, but I am curious about watching the original ones now. I'm considering it. They're, they're on oh, my nice. backlog now with like a gazillion other things that I need to watch, but maybe we'll do it for a show sometime. We'll, we'll do a, we'll as a through as and as I'll give you an excuse like, to watch the third one. As I said, I did see like Tim Burton's remake in the theaters. I didn't what? see in theaters, but yeah. I, I did see that one. One of the yes sides is I, there was like a funny anecdote from Paul Giamatti who played 
the orangutan it character. Dr. Zayas, like that version of him or something? Uh, I forget. He was an orangutan. I know, I know that. the orangutan, the big orangutan in the original movies was Dr. Zayas, and I only remember yeah. that because of the Simpsons episode where they went to oh, the yeah. Planet of the Apes musical. And, that, and that's Zayas, funny because, Dr. like, uh, Dr. The, Zayas. the showrunner, the head writer for that episode was talking about, like, uh, because it was brought up, I was talking about, like, that entire sequence for the Simpsons. Mm-hmm. And he had never seen Planet of the Apes. And they wrote that. <laughs> never. He said he, he had to ask, like, his writers, like, if, if Dr. Zayas was an actual character in the, in the movie. That they were doing, they were putting that together. There's so much about the original Planet of the Apes. It's like, like I said, it's so iconic. The ending. Yeah. Uh, you, you blew it up, you damn dirty apes. Like, that whole ending is so iconic. Um, oh, it is. I mean, it's parodied in Spaceballs, you know? It's parodied in The Simpsons. It's, there's so much that's iconic that you, you, you don't even have to have seen the movie to no. draw upon the iconography. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Getting back to, uh, I saw Paul Giamatti, like, doing this thing where, like, he was part of a discussion and he was talking about, like, doing the Tim Burton playing the apes. He said his agent called him and, and said, like, oh, no, no, we want to get you, like, a, a human part in that movie so I could see your face. And Paul Giamatti just replied to his agent and said, if you put me in Planet of the Apes and you cast me as a human, I will fire you. I will fire, <laughs> I will fire you. He had the right priorities. Yes, exactly. Even if that movie did not. Yeah. <laughs> the less we remember about that movie, the better. Right. Yeah, not good. Not good. But the, the reboot films are good. I recommend them. I'm looking to, yeah, I'm looking to see this franchise continue. I'm, I'm hoping they make more. So we talked kind of briefly just kind of about our reactions to it. I talked about my before and you talked about yours let's talk about kind of the the journey that this movie takes so to to sum it up kind of quickly i don't want to like summarize every detail of it but basically you go to this village there's this ape named noah and he's got some friends with him uh suna and and anaya whereas like his his friends and then he's got like a mom and a father his mom's like very caring his father's a little distant but is like an important figure yeah he's living this normal life in his village. It's fine. Couldn't uh, be more separated from anything going on in the universe, basically. Right. They're just completely doing their own thing in this, in this small village. It's kind of got that almost like RPG trope of like, the village gets destroyed right. and the hero oh, has yeah, to take yeah. off from the village. It's like, it does right, that, yeah. basically. Right. As part yeah, of Yeah, because it, these, these bad apes who are working for Proximus, they raid the village. They're looking for like a human woman who's been like, you know, spotted nearby. Mm-hmm. And so they raid this village, they take the, they kill a bunch of them, and they take the rest of them hostage to be like prisoners to like work in this like kind of work camp area. We don't find yeah. any about that up later. Then Noah, in his efforts to try to get his people back, his father's dead, everybody else is gone, he's, he's going to look for, for them. He takes off to this part of the world that he was always told never to go to. And he has to go through this train tunnel that goes through a mountain. And then on the other side of it, he encounters an orangutan named Raka, who is probably the highlight of the movie for me. Oh, I love Probably Raka. the best character. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> and what's interesting here is that when you saw the other characters, like, having not seen the remake movies or the, the reboot movies, like, I still knew about Caesar and I knew approximately about kind of the stuff that was going on. And the beginning of the movie kind of summarizes a lot of that stuff just in case you don't know anything about that. So I kind of got the idea of like what's going on there. You have Caesar as this kind of great ape leader. He's like the first ape to kind of become more sentient and the one that kind of tries to establish like a peaceful society for the apes. Yeah, so it's in the last three movies. When these bad apes kind of raid the village, they're saying, for Caesar! And it's like, oh wait, what's going on here? Like, you know, and and it's like, okay, so it's kind of like religion. Like, the principles are laid down by somebody who's genuinely well-meaning and then over years and years and years, they get distorted. Oh, corrupted. yeah. I see, like, you know, uh, Proximus is clearly perverting Caesar's message and the devotion the apes have for Caesar for his own ends. Yeah. He takes the name Caesar, which is kind of interesting because it's basically a follow through on, on Rome and what, what happened with Rome, like in reality, in our actual real world, where Caesar became like a title. Yeah. Like Julius Caesar was a person. Then uh, most of the stuff that we associate with Julius Caesar was actually Augustus Caesar, who also went by the name Julius Caesar as a title. And then Caesar just became a title. And that 
title stretched like all over the place, like all over the world. So if you've ever heard of like the title of Kaiser, that comes from Caesar or Tsar in Russia, like T-S-A-R, that's also a shortening of Caesar. So it's like the name Caesar just kind of became synonymous with like king. And that's how we see Proximus is trying to use the name of Caesar to like imbue himself as like this king, like this righteous leader that, that everyone will follow because he's taking that name. But what's interesting is that our the village that we open up on, Noah's village, they don't even know who Caesar is. At least our main characters don't. At least Noah doesn't, you know? He doesn't know anything about Caesar. So he sees these apes and they're screaming for Caesar and stuff as they're rampaging through his village and burning everything down. And then he encounters this orangutan, Raka. And Raka is all about, he's like the church of Caesar, you know? He's like all like a true believer in, in Caesar as like an almost deified figure. But he's like kind of following the actual teachings of Caesar versus like just using Caesar as a position of power. Now, interesting because Noah's tribe seems to have developed in isolation. Mm -hmm. They have yeah, their they, own they got separated tradition. at some point and kind of did their own thing. Yeah, they got their own traditions and stuff. They're kind of like, or at least like they're they're not aware of the larger world around them. They're not yeah. aware of these other apes until they come raiding. I mean, maybe, they just like, know there's dangerous lands past this certain point and not to go there and you know yeah exactly so noah now on this journey gets he encounters raka and, and learns about caesar from raka like the the real caesar and and everything that happened there like he doesn't know anything about that and so now we're kind of getting these like two different sides so you're, you're seeing this like okay so there's this group of people that are like peaceful or not people of apes that are peaceful that are like preaching the gospel of caesar basically and then you have this group that's like militaristic and that's using Caesar as a symbol for their own like war efforts and for their own efforts to, to grab power. And Noah is kind of introduced to these two sides of this story. And the importance of Caesar as a figure in, in this story is like massive. It's huge. Although we only see him already dead at the very beginning of the movie in his like funeral scene. Yeah. He's already dead and they're, they're burning him. And that, that's all we get of Caesar in this movie. That's the previous three movies is, is Caesar's story. Yeah, exactly. So you have this journey now and you're, you get uh, these wastelands and, and Noah's now discovering uh, kind of how the other ape society works and encounters humans for the first time. They don't even know the word human. No, they refer to them as echoes. echoes. Yeah. yeah. And the other apes refer to them as humans, but Noah's village being separated from it has kind of their own nomenclature for all that stuff, you know? Yeah. So that's like interesting as well. And then, you know, Noah ends up getting the kind of shocking discovery for him that humans used to rule the world, you know? Like, they, they always thought of as, like, humans as, like, pests almost. Like, there are things that they show up and you shoo them away. You yeah, know, get, exactly. Get, you know, like you would if you saw, like, a coyote outside your house or something. Or get out of here. And then you're, like, you're a little bit more careful watching your small pets, you know? Because you don't want them to get out and get eaten by the coyotes, you know? That's kind of how they treat humans. It's like a nuisance, a pest. And they don't really know anything about them. And, and so now Noah getting into this bigger world is learning about humans. He's got this echo that he encountered initially, the ones that the, the bad apes are kind of after. He's encountered her a few times, but he didn't really know anything about it. And then he ends up, when they're going through this adventure with Raka, he ends up taking him through like an airport terminal. And by the way, this is like LAX. Like there's certain structures you can see. I'm like, this is LAX. Like I've been to LAX. This is LAX, you know? And I learned later that they did in Indeed, like base the whole area that this is taking place on on Los Angeles. So there's like iconography in these torn down cities. It's like, yeah, I've seen some of these places, you know, like this looks familiar to me, you know, because I've been I live near L.A. and stuff. So I've been in that area. But it was really cool seeing Noah see like murals of humans, like fully dressed up in clothes and being professional and stuff. And he's like, what the hell is this? Like, why are why are there murals of humans of these echoes? They're just like scared. Scavengers, like what, what? Why are there anything of them? And he's seen these structures, like less consumed, a, a little bit less consumed by nature than where he lives. And it, it's kind of giving the idea of like, oh, there was like this great society before him that lived here, and, and this is completely foreign to him. Oh yeah, for sure. Which is just kind of cool to see. And then through this journey, you know, he ends up getting taken by the bad apes eventually in his pursuit of it's to the same goal. He gets to the same place, but he ends up getting captured and taken there instead of. 
raiding it and getting there on his own. And he finds out that this guy, uh, Proxima Caesar, is trying to get into this this structure and it, it's like a giant vault and he's trying to get into it because there's like resources inside that will further develop his power and and you see his whole crew they have like electric staffs and stuff that they can shock people with like they have like weaponry that's like somewhat advanced you know right. and they have this very like medieval like structure to their society and stuff but it's like then they're using some like modern tools and stuff and we learn that amongst this encampment this kingdom where Proximus rules there's like another human that's basically like working for him. William H. Macy, yeah. Yeah. He's kind of providing them with knowledge and information and stuff to help them get in to the vault, to help them be, you know, technologically superior to the other clans and groups in the world. And uh, he's doing it because he's like, the apes already won the world. The world's over. I'm just trying to survive and be comfortable. And by being useful, I'm, I can be comfortable. And we learn that this other human character, this other Echo that had invaded Noah's village and that kind of brought all this trouble to his doorstep. She comes from a group of humans that can all speak. They're not like the livestock type humans, you know? They, they can all speak. They can all think. And they're trying to like bring rational thought and speech back to humans. Something that they've like lost. And she's trying to get into the same vault that Proxima is trying to get into. Proxima is trying to get into it for power and she's trying to get into it to kind of also kind of for power but to, to bring power and thought and speech back back to her people. And yeah, yeah. That's kind of what the movie is about. Like that's kind of the, the it's it's a journey of this character Noah from the small village and he gets wrapped up in these bigger events and he just wants to get his people back and in doing so in in order to try to do so, he gets caught up in these machinations between Proximus and Nova or May, the human character that he encounters at the beginning. So I, I touched on it a little bit before, but there's another way we can look at this movie which is through a lens of being like the prelude to the Legend of the Zelda movie in the sense that the director who did this is going to be doing the Legend of the Zelda movie and I already mentioned like Noah's almost a silent protagonist already so that kind of almost like gives you an idea of what they could do with Link like have, giving him some dialogue but not a lot making him more introspective and stuff and that's a way that you could pull that off so that you don't end up with excuse me princess shenanigans in the Zelda movie you know oh yeah yeah and we talked really... about certain yeah. like areas and environments that are very much Zelda-like, but were, did you come away confident? Did, was there anything in particular you saw that you were like, okay, yeah, I can, I can see the Zelda movie building in my head now? Right, yeah. There, I mean, there are elements for sure. Like, I brought up the opening sequence. It's mm-hmm. like, I can equally see, like, there's parallels, like, it opens in, like, a quiet, like, village, right, mm-hmm. where the protagonist lives a quiet life until, like, a cataclysmic event happens that thrusts the protagonist out into a journey. There's Hunter- there's people with different religions and philosophies. Yep, there's a big bad who's like a ruler. Mm-hmm. His the the general for Proximus, Silva. Yes. I think I mentioned to you when I talked about it before, it really reminded me of like in Twilight Princess, there's that like one like orc character that is like the one that's kind of terrorizing the village and stuff and trying to abduct the children and the one that you like joust on multiple occasions. Like it really reminds me of that, like specifically from like Twilight like princess so i kind of got vibes from even there even from like a henchman character gave me kind of zelda vibes as well oh yeah for sure but yeah so that's pretty much it the cast i mentioned william h macy i mentioned kevin durand is in it as well most of the others i kind of don't really recognize i do recognize nova though the one human girl character you recognize her yeah i, I know who that is ella freya yeah from witcher yeah so that was kind of the the one instantly recognizable person before William H. Macy, of course. But yeah, that's it. That's Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. You said a very solid movie. I quite enjoyed it. I look forward to more movies continuing in this. I wonder what they're going to do with that, you know, with West Ball now doing Zelda. Is he going to be doing these movies as well as the Zelda movies? Are they going to hand it off to somebody else? I don't know. But it's got me a little bit interested in going to those old movies, that, or not the old movies, but the, the reboot movies, and uh, excited about what what could come from this franchise in the future. Absolutely. But that's it. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Next.
next week, we are going to be talking about Beverly Hills Cop Axel F. This is the Netflix original movie that continues the Beverly Hills Cop series. And I, I think that series has like four movies. There's like three Beverly Hills Cop movies. There's one that's supposed to be about like his son or something like that. I don't know. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> I think the only two I remember seeing are the first two. And I've seen Axel F. It came out on July 3rd, I believe. And I saw it on the 4th of July. I watched it. I'm going to rewatch that and Will's going to watch that for the first time. And it's going to be an interesting conversation because I haven't seen all the Beverly Hills Cop movies, but I've seen at least the first two. And Will hasn't seen any of them. So he's yep. coming into it completely blind, except for, you know, stuff that's in the cultural zeitgeist that he he's picked up on. But otherwise blind to this movie. And it'll be interesting to kind of see his take on that versus my take on it when we actually get to that movie. So that's what we're going to be talking about next week. So if you want to follow the conversation with us, you can just hop on Netflix and look up Beverly Hills Cop Axel F and watch that and you'll be ready to for our conversation next week. Thank you everybody for listening. Until then, you can follow me on Twitter. I am at Tyson Gifford. You can follow Will. He is at Box of Hero. You can check out our website, thetubblescreen.com. If you go to our website and open up a container story for any of our podcast episodes, scroll down to the bottom paragraph. You'll find all the relevant links to our SoundCloud page, our RSS feed. Everything's there for our podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcast client of choice, like Apple Podcasts or Pocket Cast, and the entire backlog of our podcast, as well as additional content from our various websites in the past, can be found on our YouTube channel. Links are in the same place in any of the container stories. You can check that out. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Night. Night. Thank you for listening to the On Screen Podcast, the official podcast of The Total Screen. Visit our website at thetotalscreen.com. This podcast can be found on any major podcast client, including Pocket Cast and Apple Podcast. The entire backlog of this podcast and other content can be found on our YouTube channel.